did not start out to be in business ethics. In fact, when I started, I had no idea what business ethics was. So I began uh, as a surgeon. And uh, I was a surgeon for 28 years doing general surgery at an academic medical center in Boston. Um, and it got a point in my career when um, I had seen other people slow down as they got older and some stayed too long and had, um, especially from my professor actually, who said uh, surgeons should not wait to be told that they can no longer do what they are doing. They should just decide to stop when they're at the top of their game. So I'd started to make plans to transition out of surgery to find something else to do. And I had done management courses and other things thinking that the only thing old doctors do is they transition into administration. Uh, and then one day I got called to the uh, CEO's office and was asked if I'd like to be the compliance officer for the medical center. Uh, for me, it was a chance to get out of surgery, and I had no idea what they were talking about. But I said yes. The fellows in October got together, some of them, to have a discussion before Mike passed away in 2018. Um, he had organized a symposium and talk about, from the perspective of practicing compliance of business ethics persons, practitioners, uh, what does it mean to have an ethical culture? Uh, what are the barriers? What are the ways you do it? And one of the things that they talked about um, is one should never really be looking for an ethical culture per se. One should look at an organization's culture and ask the question, is it ethical? Uh, the culture is what it is. The question is, is it ethical? And if not, why not? And if it is, what makes it ethical? Uh, and then we got into questions more about consistency, about statements and actions. That uh, whether you call them values or mission or whatever is really what the public and what the employees see are the consistency between what everybody says and what happens. So Enron is the great example people call upon. Uh, maybe they beat it to death, but maybe not. But here you have a great, you know, everybody has the picture of the uh, Code of Conduct, this wonderful book about all the wonderful things they believe in. And every employee knew that's not the way they practiced. Or um, a Wells Fargo or any of the companies. What causes the trouble is when suddenly it becomes apparent that here are the public statements and here's what actually goes on. And they don't really match. People will allow for some mismatch. But dramatic mismatches um, are a problem because people, will, people learn what they need to do to survive in a company. And they do what they need to do. And if that's not, uh, if that's not what some people would call ethical or right, these aren't people who go home and cheat and steal necessarily. Um, they're good people. They may attend whatever religious affiliation or whatever and, and think of themselves as good people. Um, but they can separate themselves to do what they need to do to survive. Um, this is human. To me, it all comes down to human behavior, marketing. I mean, at what point is marketing lying? At what point is marketing just educating? Talk to the company marketers. We're educating. Uh, yeah, much of the time. But is your marketing totally truthful? Um, uh, I just think the challenge for often for the leader of the business conduct organization within the group is highlighting things and reminding people, not just what the rules are. Uh, and so that's why watching some of the videos that some of the larger organizations can afford to do about showing dilemmas and then having a conversation. How do you solve the dilemma? What would you do? Get in with a group 
of uh, employees and saying, how would you do this? How would you do this? There aren't necessarily right answers. Again, I'm reminded of talking to someone in the defense industry when they were talking about what's a nominal gift because that was a big discussion at that point in my life with the physicians. What's nominal? $100? Yeah, well, maybe because your income is high, 100 is nominal. But if you go talk to the housekeeping staff, that's a lot of money. Um, or all I got was tickets to the Celtics game. On the floor, in the finals, I don't think that's 100 bucks, guys. Um, and so talking to one of the defense people, I said, how do you talk about bribe? Because in reality, you also have to get your stuff through the port. And he says, what he tells us people is if the, the um, officer or whoever it is in the small country that you're trying to import, if you can give him what he's looking for because you carry it in your pocket, probably okay. Not great, but okay. If you have to call back to the company to get a check cut, no, nah, you've just been bribed. Or, uh, you know, how much is a gift that you can take? Okay, if you take a gift from a rep to your company and you're going to put it on your secretary's desk so everybody sees it, that's a nominal gift. If your first reaction is take the gift, run to the car, open the trunk, put the car in, and close it, you probably shouldn't be taking that. That's not right. So it's real practical advice. I think that's one of the jobs in the practical aspect. And the business ethics literature is interesting. Sometimes it's too philosophical or obtuse for me, but, but much of it sometimes can't easily be translated into daily life. And so a lot of things that Kalman fellows talk about, some of these, you know, asking each other these practical things, what do I do? How, how did you solve this in your company? And um, I mean, again, I, I know it's, well, yeah, I'll say it. Early on, one of the things Patty Ellis did is she said, would you like me to arrange for your CEO to talk to our CEO? So my reaction is, you've just said that your CEO of a $25 billion multinational corporation would be willing to sit down with my CEO of a small healthcare service in one city. Sounds pretty good to me about, you know, the importance of compliance. I went back and told my CEO, would you like to arrange it so you can learn about compliance? He said, no, I don't think I have to. It's not necessary. And that, early on, someone gave me a message about, okay, here's your struggle. And I would fight that once in a while. And otherwise, I'd do what I needed to do with the researchers, with the physicians. Um, one of the advantages for me in having been a physician at the hospital for 28 years and knowing everybody was the ability when a physician started to say, well, this is important, this is patient care, this is, you know, to say, you know, bullshit. Come on, you know, don't give me that. Now let's talk. These are the things you should do. The law says you have to. I know it's, I know it's annoying. I know it bothers you. Let me give you a hint about how to do it so it's easy. Short way to phrase it, maybe. It's really about finding practical solution. All the employees, physicians, whatever it is, just make my life easier. I have a tough job. I'm running around. I just want to make my life easier. I know you have things to do. And I think that the compliance's job is to go anywhere in the organization, any organization, say, what is it I can do to make your life easier and help you comply? There's, there's some progress and there's not progress. There's progress in it becoming more of a profession. People are realizing what's necessary. At the same time, uh, that progress has included becoming much more um, rules-based and rigid. And it's lost some of its ability to really uh, touch base with academia and what's going on in other areas. Uh, I think there's not progress when you look at, for example, what grew early was the Healthcare Compliance Association, and that was just about healthcare. And one of my issues has always been, you know, there's ethics. There's ethics in the context of business, there's ethics in the context of medicine, there's ethics in the context of defense industry. There's not business ethics, there's not medical ethics, there's ethics in the context of. And you all can learn from each other. Now, 
a number of years ago, the whoever owned the Healthcare Compliance Association also joined with the uh, Society for Compliance, the SCCE. They're still separate societies. I have asked when, you know, their former CEO, why? Never got an answer. And I still ask, why? Why don't you have a business or a compliance uh, group that brings everybody together to learn from each other? One of the greatest things for me was taking the management in eth MEO course, Managing Ethics in Organizations, and to meet people from Caterpillar, from the banks, from foreign countries, and ask them the same questions that I was struggling with, and hear how they did it. These challenges, you know, how do you deal with gifting? Why, gifting is a healthcare problem? No. Gifting is a problem in every industry. Um, I kept asking just because I like to ask the question to my lawyer friends. As a physician, it's illegal for me to get referral payments. Why isn't it illegal for you? A great comment. Are the conversations Michael Coffin and I used to have? Michael, I have a compliance program in a hospital because I have to. How come there's no compliance program in a university, even though you're centered here as a center? Some univer many universities, I think, today now do have ethics or compliance programs, but it took them a while to get there. And yet, if you, as a business school, had a center for it and were teaching it, how come you didn't have one? And I think that's human nature. We tend to be blind, and we don't have a problem.